Hi, this is Arthur. You're listening to Two Blots Talking Politics. Hey everybody, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. I'm on with my co-host Sophie. Hey Sophie. Hey Kelly. And joining us today is Kaz Wida, who's a freelance journalist uh, who works with Rant Media. Hi Kaz. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, So hopefully by the time everyone is listening, I will be out of Twitter jail. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's it's been a, a day for Twitter uh, or a few days, but um, there there's been a lot going on in the news, and a lot of this sort of stuff gets amplified and spread around by Twitter. And I didn't actually do anything bad to get put in Twitter jail, but people do, and uh, sometimes people get banned for things, and sometimes they shouldn't. So uh, maybe we should start by talking a little bit about sort of the big news story of the past few days, uh, or at least the story that has taken over everything, whether or not it should have, which is this story about uh, the Indigenous People's March that was in Washington, D.C., and it was at the same time as the Right to Life March. And there were a bunch of high school kids from Covington, Kentucky, from a small Catholic school who interacted with uh, some people at the other march. They were there for the Right to Life march, interacted with some people at the other march, and has led to a several-day now brouhaha. <laughs> so, I, Kaz, what do we sort of think about all of this? Uh, there there seems to have been a lot, of, um, a, a lot to dissect with how the media is covering all of this. Well... I think what you're seeing is a real concerted effort to start a culture war by people who are interested in seeing that happen. Um, Because number one, it's a great distraction from real issues. Not that this isn't a real issue, but, and number two, it benefits folks who want to make money off of culture wars and who want clicks and, and sort of the sensationalism of it. So Sadly, what that means, though, is that the people who are sort of at the center of this controversy end up getting swept up in it in a lot of different ways. But I think one of the things that really struck me about this whole thing is that, you know, the way that the media is sort of both sizing it is is very typical for them. And they sort of reverted back to some of the default coverage, I guess I would say where they feel like rather than presenting something that's fair, they have to give a platform to everyone for everything. And by doing that, they sort of reinforce the idea that, you know, a certain narrative of what happened is justified. And all it does is just sort of amp up this tension up and up and up. I mean, you saw it on Twitter, right? You sort of (laughs) couldn't escape it everywhere you went over the weekend. So... Yeah, it was kind of shocking. I actually, at some point, uh, again, this is not what I was put in Twitter jail for, but <laughs> I, I was trying to like just be like, can I find a spot on Twitter where I don't have to watch this video again? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't want to see these boys' smug faces anymore. And it, it was very difficult to to even like find. And granted, like everybody I follow is all political, and you know, so uh, of course I've put myself into those spaces. But it was hard to just get away from it at all. Yeah, and I, for me, one of the things that I did was sort of take a step back and look at, you know, regardless of who said what or who pushed who first or who was doing what in this whole hour-long video, the fact remains is that these boys were being chaperoned, and it was a school field trip. And that is the thing that just blows me away. And the whole premise of it, that you would take a busload of boys from the only all-male school in northern Kentucky to go protest a woman's right to control her own reproductive system is absolutely batty to me. Like, why would you take a whole group of teenagers on a trip like that, number one? And then number two, 
small would you stand by why this was happening? Because as we've seen sort of emerge in the last couple of days, there are several videos of these boys like heckling people and doing all sorts of different things over the course of the day. And I keep thinking, where are these chaperones? I actually don't even really blame the kids. I mm-hmm. I can't figure out what the hell is going on with these chaperones. Where was the school staff? Where are they during this whole day and all these interactions? Where are these people? And and I hold them primarily responsible. You know, I don't. I'm not saying I feel sorry for the boys. They obviously acted very badly, as did a lot of other people who were there at the time. But what really struck me a lot is just these <laughs> these chaperones, the school staff. None of them should have allowed that to go on, and especially for as long as it did. I think it was like an hour, an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. And as I was talking with a friend of mine on social media, shout out to Michelle, it's really surprising to me that the chaperones or whoever was supposed to be sort of directing this trip didn't speak to the kids about what to do if approached by people who disagree with them. I mean, that's kind of like bringing your kids to a protest 101, no matter what side of the protest you're on. You know, you're always supposed to talk to your kids about here's what happens if, you know, things get aggressive. Here's what you're supposed to, I want you to do, you know, what you're supposed to do if people confront you. This is not like a really neutral issue that these kids were protesting. And so I'm really shocked that, and apparently talking to a lot of my friends at other private Catholic schools, this is like not an uncommon thing for more conservative Catholic schools to do is bus students to this march, this particular march. So like, I'm really surprised that there weren't any adults who gave them, you know, maybe a a little short crash course in sort of protest expectations before they went out. I'm I'm really surprised that nobody thought that it would be possible that they would interact with people who disagreed with them there. Well, and I think the other thing, too, that really struck me, so I went and looked into Covington quite a bit and just looked at the history of the school, and there are a lot of schools like this in the South, um, private schools, charter schools, too, where the tuition's pretty high. And it seems to attract a certain kind of of student. And it is not a diverse environment. It's just not. At Covington specifically, this is almost exclusively all white and all male. But it's a school that's sitting, it's about 500 students. It sits right on the outskirts there of Cincinnati. And it's, it's weird to me that it would be... You know, it's sitting on the outskirts of a city that should have some diversity, and it just doesn't. (laughs) Um, The Mm -hmm. school does not have the kind of diverse population that would represent the area. It's actually um, flush with the most diverse school district in Kentucky is the neighboring school district. And to look at the website, I I flipped through a bunch of the pages, and I didn't encounter an obvious um, photo of anyone who I would say was a person of color. That's pretty alarming. And and you've got to think about the community and the parents that support the school and that, you know, would place their students in this sort of environment. I guess I have to expect that there's sort of a, a privileged perspective going on there. <laughs> well, if you look at Google has, you know, like a sort of review page for the school, as it does for many other like institutions and businesses. And if you look at some of the reviews from two or three years ago, there's one in particular where someone actually says, I love how expensive this school is because I feel like I can go to any college I want because I paid this much to go to school. <laughs> And I was just sort of floored that anybody would actually say that. But I guess people do believe and actually say things like that. They do have a 90 percent college acceptance rate. So 90 percent of the students who attend there end up going to the college of their choice. That's pretty high, especially compared to other schools. But, you know, it's one of those situations where you really see how some of these schools almost reinforce segregation in the South. Um, Mm -hmm just because of the way the system works and, and income inequality and, and how, um, you know, it's $8,000 a year to send your kid there. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if I, if I was a parent and I had a child who didn't fit in there, I'm not sure I'd feel comfortable sending them. 
knowing what that environment was like, even if I had the money and lived in that community. Yeah, and I I, I just want to make sure to make a note that Catholic schools are not like this everywhere. (laughs) So my kids go to Catholic school, uh, but Catholic school in Chicago is very, very different uh, and much more racially diverse. So uh, and nowhere near as expensive, which is part of the reason uh, that it ends up being more racially and socioeconomically diverse. Um, But yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly something going on in the South uh, with not just these Catholic schools, but all of these private schools and, you know, trying to be as undiverse as possible. Yeah. And, and I think too, one of the things that I saw in the coverage, at least of this situation was also quite a lot of privilege. (laughs) I saw a lot of folks like Jake Tapper sort of beat the drum about, hey, you know, these are, these are just teenagers and we've interpreted this wrong and they, you know, didn't do anything wrong because they were faced with this sort of hostile environment. And, you know, there's some of that edging there that happens there's a couple of folks that I saw doing that over the weekend in mainstream media where they doubled back and sort of said, oh, I apologize. I think I misinterpreted this video. And it seemed like everyone was sort of eager to jump on the bandwagon. You get that with the mainstream media sometimes where one or two people sort of pick out this kind of narrative of both sides. And then they all start swinging that way mm-hmm. because they see that it's a culture war. They see that there is a chance to get people really invested in the story. And so they start just pitting them against each other um, and finding ways to kind of wedge that issue. And it starts, you know, there have been accounts, I think, on Twitter that have been suspended that retweeted this video initially that they're saying were intentionally sort of spreading false propaganda about it. And I don't know that that's true. But it certainly seems like there's a lot of debate back and forth about how did this start and how did it get so out of control, the whole controversy surrounding it. Let's talk a little bit about that both sides-ism because I'm really interested in it. And I know you had mentioned like the promise of clicks being a motivation, but I'm – I've – you know, I've I've studied journalism before as well, and I'm interested in sort of the way in which the media feels this like responsibility to always give equal time to opposing views, even when those opposing views don't have equal like factual validity. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. if you can maybe speak to where you think that's coming from. I think a lot of it is a as a reflection of those same environments of privilege that we were just talking about that the Covington students enjoy. So when you look at newsrooms in America, they are not diverse places. Um, the people who are making decisions about coverage, most of the journalists that you know work and and are the face of um, newsrooms and anchors and such, are not people of color. They're and a lot of them are not women. It is more than more than the average white and male. So if you look at Pew Research, I think, took some of the census data from 2012 and then again in 2016, when they said, all things being equal, let's compare the workers in media and in newsrooms to that U.S. worker population. And they found that um, 77% of the people who work in media are white. 77%. And 48% of them are white men. And that's whether they're journalists or editors or, you know, working in TV journalism, camera work, that sort of thing. In comparison to the average U.S. worker population, only 34% are white males. So by a margin of more than 10%, our newsrooms and our media sources skew white and male. And you have to believe that you see that in the coverage. And I, I think what happens is, is when you literally don't have skin in the game, you sit on the sidelines like a spectator and it becomes some sort of sport where you're keeping score in this culture war. And it's, it's not something they're invested in because it doesn't affect their daily life. Mm -hmm. They don't have to live the reality of racism every day. And so for them, it's, they can maintain distance from it and they call it, fairness and civility, right? But that's because it doesn't feel personal to them because it's not personal to them. 
And I think a lot of uh, the issues with newsrooms and with coverage and with mainstream media, to some extent, pretty much boil down to that. They are not representative of the population in America. They're just not. And so, you know, we certainly saw this play out in the 2016 election, uh, not as much with race, but uh, with gender, certainly. And and with just trying to show both sides somehow, whether or not there were both sides to to show. And so, you know, the Trump Foundation, which literally is <laughs> had to be broken down now or the and because they were it operating, you know, in ways that a charity is not supposed to, because people brought up problems with that, then the, the newspapers were like, well, there must be problems with the Clinton Foundation, too. And, you know, and sort of found little things to pick apart to, to do this sort of both sides thing. Mm-hmm. So we certainly saw it in the 2016 election. Are you concerned that we will see this sort of thing happen in the 2020 election? Are we already seeing this sort of thing happen in the 2020 election? <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely, we we are. You saw you saw birtherism rear its head this morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, here we go. So Camilla Harris isn't, isn't a citizen. Is that what we're saying? She was born in Oakland. Like, Stop. We've done this before. I've been down this road. I'm not going down this road again with you all. <laughs> we can't we can't do this again. I can't watch 2016 happen again. And I think a lot of certainly people who are not part of the mainstream media see that happening and are like, no, oh, no. We're sort of doomed to repeat that to some extent because we do not have gender diversity and we do not have racial diversity in newsrooms. So I think the only major publication that has a 50-50 split, meaning there are as many women in leadership as men, is the Washington Post. Mm. And it's interesting because I I can kind of see it in their coverage, you know, in comparison to maybe something like the New York Times, right? The Chicago Tribune, I'm sorry to tell you, is particularly bad. Um, (laughs) This does not surprise me. (laughs) Racial diversity and gender diversity, they're they're really bad. It's, you know, and and to be fair, it's not just the media, right? 72%, I think, um, of the top 16 Fortune 500 companies are run by white men, you know, and those are just the ones who are willing to give you data about what their um, leadership looks like. A lot of, you know, media organizations and, and Fortune 500 companies won't even give you that information. They've tried to do research and they won't be transparent about it because they know how bad it looks. And, and so, yes, I think we're going to continue to have this problem. I've already seen it. <laughs> it's already happening. It's going to be particularly bad and we're going to have to constantly stay on media sources about this because there are so many women and people of color running. And I'm thrilled but it is going to be a knockdown, drag out fight to get them not to return to these old habits of, you know, both sides. I get to sit on my perch of privilege and instead of, you know, sometimes your mother used to say to you, it's not about being fair, that the fair thing is not about everyone gets equal, right? Fair is not equal. So I think a lot of times they think, well, we got to give everybody equal coverage. That's fair. That's both sides. But that's not an accurate picture of what's actually happening. And it's not a fair or balanced perspective in a lot of cases. And because they aren't people of color and they aren't women, they miss it. They don't see it because they don't live it. They're blind to it. So I think we're sort of doomed. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Do you suppose that stereotypes about gender and ability are playing into this even in newsrooms where there is some representation i'm what i'm wondering about this because i've worked in uh newsrooms in like community or small town newspapers and in my experience not only were the newsrooms not diverse but in general the people assigned to cover the political beat local or national tended to be men and the women tended to be assigned to do sort of the community news stories or the food section, stuff like that. So I'm wondering if you think maybe there is, even on top of a lack of representation, maybe some sort of subconscious bias going on in terms of who gets to cover political stories. 
where I think that also comes into is when you look at online news versus, Mm -hmm. you know, print or television. So in online news, we actually have better diversity. And I sat down and puzzled about that for a while, but I figured out what it is. It's because you can do it from home. So women who are often, you know, managing um, being the primary caretaker for children or elderly parents or what have you can multitask and do all the unpaid labor of the household and then also do all of the online um, sort of publication that's freelance and that's not Um, well paid. And in fact, what Mm -hmm. I suspect, if you were to look really hard at employment numbers, you would find that um, there's a ton of baked into that number, there's a ton of underemployment. So women, people of color who are not um, able to have or, or don't have the privilege and the opportunity to have and the support to have full time jobs where they leave the house, go to work, um, and and work at these publications that uh, provide them a path towards a career in leadership or, you know, editors, that sort of thing. And that's why you have no bench. There's no bench for the editorial staff in terms of diversity and and gender. Um, They don't have a lot of people that they can tap to come up through the ranks because they just haven't built in those opportunities for uh, women and, and for minorities. And as newspapers are cutting their stuff and are folding Mm -hmm. and are pushing more people to, you know, be stringers and freelance and fewer people to be Mm -hmm. full time in a newsroom, it's probably, you know, becoming less important for to the newsroom, not to us, but (laughs) to the newsroom that they worry about things like diversity. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's also (laughs) that we have baked into our ideas of who to trust and who's credible uh, this sort of authority authority figure, and, and that picture is usually white and male. We think traditionally of people like Dan Rather, right? When you think of who you trusted as a news source or who your parents trusted as a news source, I guarantee you it was not a woman and it was probably not a person of color. And so we have to acknowledge that when we think about, we have a subconscious, right? And when we think about, do I trust this source? That's our frame of reference. And news networks know that, right? So they're also feeding into that and realizing that the folks that they give authority to and that will give them better ratings and that will give them more clicks are the people that we already instinctually trust because we have those biases. And so we've already seen this come out. You mentioned the the birtherism stuff, but the other way this mm-hmm. has come out already in the 2020 cycle is uh, in, in two ways, really. CBS said, you know, put out this thing that like they'd hired the people who were going to cover the 2020 election and they had no African-American reporters on that. <laughs> uh, and they, they got a lot of flack for that. Uh, and I think they did end up hiring someone. Uh, but the other way it came out was uh, before Kamala actually announced when she did sort of her pre-announcement, she was at Howard University, uh, which is her alma mater. And uh, there was a reporter who was there covering her, Chelsea James, I yeah. think, uh, yep. who is new to politics reporting for one thing comes from a sports beat yes she's a sports reporter <laughs> yeah right so but bizarre. She, you know she said something you know and she was she was covering in good faith you know she wasn't this was all stuff that she she didn't even realize uh, she was had certain biases but she said something about that that Kamala was welcomed with a screech Mm-hmm. And it turned out that actually that was a very particular sound that the women of Alpha Kappa Alpha, which is a yeah. huge African American sorority, it's a sound that they make, and you know it, it. So of course Kamala would have known what that meant, but this reporter did not, and you know so there was this whole question of should she have known? Shouldn't she have known? You know, should she have leaned to the person next to her and say, you know, what were they saying? But the. The point really at the heart of all of this, whatever you think about this individual reporter doing that, is maybe you shouldn't have just white reporters <laughs> covering an African-American candidate who may not 
notice or understand things like that. And so it, it yeah. really sort of plays into a lot of this is, you know, what it, reporters to a certain extent already had to figure out how to cover Barack Obama, but you know, that would, that was sort of one level, uh, you know, if you have a, a African American man, but to have a woman, you know, they already don't know how to cover women and aren't very good at it, you know, and to have an African American Indian woman, you know, what, what does that mean? How do we cover her? And, and I suspect that's not the last time they're going to have trouble figuring out that tension. Yeah. And you know, the people who make the decisions about who gets that assignment, right? These are editors. And again, you have the same problem. The people who are making the decisions about coverage, you know, whether or not the journalist is is white or a person of color, the editors typically are not. So I think only 25% of news organizations have a minority in the top three people on their editorial staff. So if you look at who is their managing editor, who is their executive editor, only 25% of news organizations have a minority of any sort in the top three of those positions. And those are the people who are saying, you know, hey, go cover this candidate. Um, They make those decisions. And if they don't have that frame of reference, they're probably not making the right decision. It is discouraging. (laughs) Yeah. I uh, just as a total side note, I live about a mile from the international headquarters of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And so I knew things like their colors and stuff, but I did not know about this uh, skiwi thing that they do. Uh, So I I learned something too, and I was very excited to to learn something. I kind of wanted to walk into the the building and be like, oh, wow, this is so cool. But that didn't seem appropriate either. I had a friend who actually uh, went to college in uh, the D.C. area, and he picked up on it right away. He knew exactly what it was. And he said, oh, man, you know, they really screwed this up. And his comment was, is that, um, you know, black fraternities have a very, very rich history, and they are very, very intimate groups. And they keep those ties. Usually, he said, you know, from college on throughout their careers and, and throughout their lives. And those end up being very close knit groups. And, and, and so likely there was a whole bunch of history there that that reporter was not even dimly aware of for that group. So yeah, and history that could end up being very important in whether Kamala can mobilize certain communities and, you know, what kind of support she's going to have. And so it, it could be a story that's really important, more important than just, you know, did the reporter in the moment understand what she was saying or not? Right. And, you know, to be fair to that reporter, she did apologize and yes, she seemed yes. mortified by her mistake. And I don't necessarily, you know, she she knows now, um, <laughs> but it was, that's a hard lesson to learn. And her editor should really have never put her in that position. So as a sports reporter of all things, <laughs> So the other news that broke today that I think may also be informed to some extent by having so little diversity in newsrooms is uh, that the transgender ban in the military, uh, essentially the Supreme Court said that parts of the ban can continue to go into effect while the lower courts are still hashing it out. So there's not like a final decision on all of this, um, but it's no longer stopped from moving forward in certain ways. I mean, this is another area where we have virtually no diversity in newsrooms right now. And I, I'm wondering if, if we think there's any any nuance to the coverage, if if that seems like it's being covered in a fair way. I mean, the one thing that's really troubling to me, not just in the reporting on this, but the reporting on a lot of issues is uh, – it, it, being framed in stories as a a win or a loss, you know, so the Trump administration scores a big win on, you know, being able to ban transgender people from the military. And it's like, that's not a win. That's not a win for anybody. You know, I, I think that we shouldn't be thinking about politics so much in those terms of win and loss. And that, you know, maybe in a way, it's it's because of this privilege that you pointed out that if if you don't have skin in the game, if to you, this is just I'm reporting from on high about what's going on, that it's easier to sort of think of things in terms of wins and losses. Yeah. And when I heard that news, all I could think of is these poor people who have 
made this, you know, the cornerstone of their life and, and served and really been very passionate um, about it. And we're telling them, we don't want you here. And, and it's so sad to me because the majority of Americans don't feel that way. I think it's 58%, maybe more. That was a couple of months ago, I think, when I saw that poll, but support transgender service members. And so you're getting a ruling from a court where minority rule is sort of baked in, and it doesn't really reflect how the majority of Americans feel about having transgender service members in our military. It's just not reflective of the reality. And so my heart just hurt when I saw that. Just, I think of real people. It's, Mm -hmm. I think of real people that I know and how, you know, they already struggle to feel accepted and it's just not fair to do this to them and to take that away from them. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that really gets me in the reporting, at least, is the complete absence of science. They keep arguing about this as if there is a valid medical reason that transgender people can't serve. And that is not factual. It is mm-hmm. not factual. And they continue to leave that out of the discussion as if there is some sort of both sides to the science behind it. There is not. Um, mm-hmm. Many, many medical professionals have said there is absolutely no reason um, that transgender folks can't serve in the military. This is not something that should be an obstacle. And yet we continue to kind of leave that out of the story. And I, and I think it's because you know, the people who are writing the stories and the editors and, and the folks crafting coverage don't really have the relevant knowledge. And they also mm-hmm. aren't really seeking it out. Yeah, that's interesting. We only put science reporters on, you know, quote unquote, science stories. So maybe mm-hmm. you'll have a science reporter on like a climate change story, although even then, maybe not. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, we do need more. I mean, we need more science competency, science literacy everywhere in this country, certainly in our politics. But but I think it it would be great to have more of that in our, our reporting too. You know, and it, it makes sense that someone's not going to go to med school and then turn around and also go to journalism <laughs> school and, you know, become a, a reporter. But, but certainly there are people who could learn a lot more. I mean, it'd be interesting to look at the major journalism schools in this country and see if any of them ask their reporters to take a science class, you know, before they get a a degree in journalism. Do any of them, or, you know, sort of how to cover science, uh, do any of them ask their students to take politics courses? You know, are people really sort of narrowly focused and can we still afford to have that in journalism? Well, I think it takes a natural curiosity and maybe that's what's missing from um, some of the folks who are covering these stories, because you don't need to be an expert, but you have to ask the questions. And they're not asking the right questions. They're focused, again, as you said, on it as if it was some sort of game. And there's someone who's winning and someone who's losing, and their job is simply to report the score. And that's not that's not journalism. You know, we can teach computers to do that. <laughs> we don't need journalism. Mm-hmm. I, I continue to, to really be baffled by the lack of context in a lot of stories. And, and that frame um, is probably missing because of what we discussed before, which is a lot of publications are operating on shoestring budgets. They're using freelancers like myself, um, folks that don't have journalism degrees or any, in some cases, not even any writing experience. And they don't have the professional background to actually be journalists, and yet they're writing in these stories. And that's why they're not asking the right questions. But you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. Yes. See also (laughs) the state of higher education in this country. (laughs) (laughs) So we've identified, I think, some really important problems. Do we have any uh, solutions or thoughts towards solutions? Are there new sources we should be seeking out? Are there things we should be demanding of our news sources? Do you have any thoughts on that? I would continue um, to keep an eye just on some of the diversity in the newsroom stats and and studies that are done. Um, There are some newsrooms who are really making a concerted effort. So as I mentioned before, the Washington Post is about as solid as it gets on both racial and gender diversity. There's certainly lots of room for improvement, but they're one of the folks that are actually doing pretty well. 
the Wall Street Journal, surprisingly, um, is doing all right in that respect. Again, room for improvement. But those are two sources, major sources that jump out at me that, you know, if you wanted to get well balanced, some people say, oh, the Washington Post leans left. Well, the Wall Street Journal leans right. So how about read both of them? And then, you know, read maybe two or three other sources. I mean, that's the big message. You really have to diversify your news and you really have to go ask the right questions and be curious um, because unfortunately I don't think the media is going to bring it to you. The media doesn't really work for you anymore. It used to be that it was sort of a public service, but that's not how it functions now. It is now a corporate business and they are in the business of making money and they are not in the business of um, providing you know, the best information out there unless they are incentivized to do so. So we have to incentivize them. And, you know, you see that with campaigns like Grab Your Wallet where they say, all right, you know, this was real lousy coverage. This person really screwed this up. We're going to boycott this network this week or we're going to do X, Y, or Z. And hopefully those things kind of move the needle to incentivize those networks and those publications to invest in diversity and in really try to craft their coverage in a more thoughtful way. All right. Are there any of your recent pieces that you want to make sure people go look at? You know, the one that I did most recently um, was actually about science. Since we were talking about science, I um, wrote a little bit about supplements and multi-level marketing and how it took over Utah and made Utah the center of sort of health industry supplement scams. So an anti-vaccination is on the rise in the state sort of a correlation to that situation. So um, if you wander over to worldofweirdthings.com, that's where my latest is on on supplements. All right. And we'll put a link up to that as well. So Kaz, thanks so much for uh, joining us on the podcast. This has been really fun. I think maybe as we get further into the uh, presidential cycle, which is going to take over all of our lives very soon. (laughs) We'll want to check back in and and see how the news is covering the presidential candidates. (laughs) Yes, hopefully I'll have better news then and and more optimism, I I hope. (laughs) (laughs) And hopefully by then I'll be out of Twitter jail. So uh, catch us on Twitter. (laughs) Uh, And if you don't already follow Kaz on Twitter, definitely do. I I love uh, how you sort of pull apart issues and and your threads are really great. So I hope Uh, everybody goes and follows you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I follow you as well. So. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you. And uh, everybody stay warm, at least here in Chicago. It's going to get bitter cold by the end of this week. So Mm -hmm. Uh, climate change is still happening and we'll be back to climate change (laughs) next week on the podcast. Uh, The weather and the climate have nothing to do with each other. I'm sure you all know that, but science is an important skill. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you, Kaz. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.